Welcome to Lama Surya Das's Awakening Now podcast. We are very pleased to share with you Lama's unique illumination of the awakened awareness teachings. If you are interested in supporting Lama Surya Das's podcast, please go to beherenownetwork.com slash Surya Das. A very close to my heart, spiritual altruism, the Bodhisattva way, the Bodhisattva career, the Bodhisattva as an exemplar, as an exemplary model of how we can be today, our best self, our highest self, how we can be a light in the world, the Bodhisattva, Bodhi, to awaken or awakening, the root of the word Bodha, to enlighten, to illumine, Bodhi, to wake up, Bodhi, Sattva, being. The Bodhi being, Bodhisattva, the Buddha to be, the Bodhisattva, the spiritual hero, spiritual warrior, as Chogyam Trump Rinpoche called it. The light being, the Bodhisattva, the enlightened leader, edifier, awakener, the Bodhisattva. Lord Buddha himself, Sakyamuni Buddha, 2,500 years ago, our teacher said he had been a Bodhisattva, a Buddha to be, a Buddha in training for 500 previous lives, 500 lives, however you understand that. It means it's a long process of spiritual evolution. It's a path. It's not just an event. It's not just a weekend. It's not just an enlightenment intensive. It's not even just a one-year retreat. I mean, even shyly, after a six-year retreat, six years, six months, whatever, six lifetimes, there may still be further to go. Who knows? Or not. Depends on how you look at it. Everything is subjective, the essence of Buddhism. Everything is subjective. Sunyata in Sanskrit, not what we think it is. Sunyata. That's the wisdom of Dharma. To let go of opinions and to see things as they are. To understand reality or truth as it is. To cultivate and realize wisdom, the sixth paramita or parami of the bodhisattva. So tonight I want to talk about, and this is the workbook for this subject. Some of you have studied this in the course here. Buddha is as Buddha does. Uh, My title of the book was going to be The Bodhisattva Way, or How to Be a Bodhisattva, or when I was looking for something more like a a movie kind of thing, The Bodhisattva Code. (laughs) But Tom Hanks, I mean my editor rejected that and wanted it to be something more popular with the word Buddha in it, so it became Buddha is as Buddha does and bees Buddha. The Ten Original Practices for Enlightened Living, about the Bodhisattva Code, the code of the altruistic, selfless spiritual warrior, the spiritual hero, the enlightened leader, the light being, the edifier, awakener, the Bodhisattva, the Buddha to be, the Bodhisattva. The Buddhist hero, the Buddhist superhero, who becomes a bodhisattva by practicing these ten paramis in Pali language, paramitas in Sanskrit. In the original scriptures, the Pali suttas, there were ten paramis, paramitas of the bodhisattva, as elucidated by the teacher, the Buddha himself. Later, these were reduced to six in Vajrayana Buddhism, for simplicity's sake, folded into that. But whether it's six or ten doesn't matter. In the many Mahayana sutras, there are ten also, like the Dasa Bhumika Sutra. And if you study Tibetan Buddhism, you see the ten paramitas many places, like Ampopa's Jewel Ornament of Liberation, Milarepa's teachers, uh, Milarepa's disciples, classic scripture, and so forth. But the real Buddhist classic about the Bodhisattva path, or path, if you're a, um, if you're a Mahayana Buddhist, is by Shanti Deva, the peace master, called The Way of the Bodhisattva. You can read that. It's a great book. Well translated by Padmakar Committee, well translated by Stephen Batchelor and others. The Way of the Bodhisattva by Shanti Deva, the peace master of the 8th century AD. Of course, if you read these texts, you have to have a lot of patience and perseverance. So, as my job is to help be a bridge here and to translate not just the words but also the concepts, I wrote this book about how to be a bodhisattva and the ten practices. How we can practice the first paramita, dana, generosity, 
on the outer, inner, and secret levels, according to the Tibetan commentator's understanding. And this is what you could learn tonight. How to analyze Dharma and analyze reality, actually, more deeply, something some of our world leaders could well learn, outer, inner, and deepest levels, not just looking at the outer and jump to quick conclusions like the letter of the law, but look into the spirit or the intent of the law. Not just read what's written on the lines, but what's between the lines. So I analyze this and explain. There's a lot of stories here, and a lot of this comes from the Mahayana scriptures and others about the Buddha practicing dana paramita. For example, when he gave in a previous life, his, his, he gave, as a prince in Nepal at Nama Buddha, place in Nepal. He gave his life to a starving tigress to feed her kids, her cubs. The ultimate generosity to give your life to save lives. So in the outer level, dana paramita, generosity means giving material things like money, food, medicine, clothes, and so on. That's how we practice and become more generous. But in the inner level, what does it mean? It means giving of ourselves. Just giving money to get your name on the wall of a wing of the um, church or the hospital has a little egotism mixed in with it, doesn't it? Would it be seen as good by others or even to, be feel, to feel good? Much as we like to feel good and doing right, good, it feels good. Virtue is its own reward. It feels good and right, and we have no choice anyway but to do what's right. I mean, I hope we do what's right because it's right, not so we'll be reborn in a better place later. But... Even feeling good is a little bit of a personal reward. Unselfish giving, the paramita of generosity, the, the transcendental virtue of generosity, royal giving, noble giving as Buddhists call it, is to give with that expectation of reward. Unconditional giving, like unconditional love, not I'll love you if you love me. Come on, you first. You know, I love those who are nice to me and so on. But what about loving your enemies? How, that's unconditional love. Love is Unconditional love is beyond the dichotomies of like and dislike. Love is much bigger. Buddha's love, Jesus' love, unconditional love. So Dana Paramita externally is giving material things. Internally is giving of oneself, one's time, one's energy, giving love, giving support, giving protection, lending an ear, lending a shoulder. Letting go, non-attachment, is internal generosity. Open-handedness, open heart, open-minded, tolerant, is internal generosity, dana paramita. <clears throat> These are not just virtues. Every Sunday schooler knows the virtues, and every religion has its same code of the virtues. But we're talking about the paramita, the paramita, the transcendental virtue, the unconditional, transformative, enlightening practice of the giving giving up of oneself in the giving, like the Good Samaritan. Giving of oneself in love without expectation of return, hopefully like we do with our children. So internally is giving oneself, and then secretly at the ultimate subtlest level is to be in touch with the infinite abundance or that there's no shortage or just the infinite riches of being not material, not energy, just openness is the ultimate generosity. And each of the transcendental virtues can be practiced on these outer, inner, and secret levels. Generosity arises from unselfishness and non-attachment. That's the first paramita, dana paramita. Ethics, shila paramita, you know, uh, Shila's name is actually a, a kind of Indian way of saying Shila. Shila Paramita, virtue. Moral self-discipline. Shila means Shila. Ethics. Morality. Self-discipline. Ethics, the second Paramita, involves virtue, integrity, character, and self-discipline. The third Paramita, Kshanti Paramita, patience or forbearance, requires resilience, acceptance, and fortitude. So it's not just waiting for something to happen patiently. It's also accepting and tolerant, flexible. And each of these paramitas we can look at in the outer, inner, and secret levels. And that's how we practice them. That's how we become enlightened. 
That's how the Bodhisattva did, who became Buddha. That's how we do. As the Dalai Lama said to me in, uh, in 2006 when I was introducing him to a, a big football stadium full of fans at the, my alma mater, the University of Buffalo, New York, he said, it's not enough just to meditate and pray today, which are always good things to do, but we also must take positive action in this world. And I think the Bodhisattva is a good role model or exemplar of this as an icon, as an archetype, as an ideal for us all. And not just for us. I mean, our time is gone. For the next generations, for the young people. I'm looking around the room. I'm glad to see there's still a few young people here and a few people who are still young at heart. But we have to start thinking about passing it on if we haven't already. And I'm, I hope you have. You know, not just being consumers, but being producers and distributors for the next generations. Gathering what wisdom we can and passing it on to the next generations. Very important. So I think the Bodhisattva exemplar or model or archetype is a very good model, role model for us and for the future generations to get excited about. And I've noticed, I've noticed that, in fact, altruism and volunteerism and charity and these things are really coming on today. Although the world is its usual greedy, competitive, warlike, um, confused and materialistic self, and it probably will always be, Many young people are volunteering and working for charity instead of going to graduate school for MBAs and so forth today. Have you noticed? It's very interesting, the young people, and especially regarding the environment and other things that they can really get their teeth into. Many of us are boomers. We're from the 60s generation. The young people don't want to sit on the floor with candles and chant Kumbaya and talk about peace. Of course they want peace, but they're very active about the environment and other things. I was just reading the paper today. That 13-year-old has a whole movement of micro-donations through the Internet. A 13-year-old. I mean, I can't even find the on and off switch of my computer half the time. And he's raising money for good causes through the Internet with micro-donations, as little as $1, raising thousands of dollars for good causes. It's a beautiful thing. So the paramitas are a great practice. Not just ideals, we should be more generous. But we can practice it. As Buddha said, when a wealthy business person, man, a householder, a businessman came to see him and said, I'm very stingy, oh great teacher, I'm very stingy. I have a hard time giving even to my children. Buddha who is very, very, very practical, as you know, if you study the suttas and his dialectic, his dialogues and all, very practical. He said, just start moving the money from one pocket to the other. Get it moving. If you can't give it to your wife, if you can't give it to your children, get it moving from one pocket to the other. Get it moving. So like the efficiency expert today would say, break it down. Chunk it down and take it little bit by bit. Reconditioning, to put it in modern terms. Karma means conditioning. People don't understand karma very well. It's worth studying. There's many different kinds of karma. You know, there's personal karma, there's group karma, there's species karma, there's collective karma, there's partial karma, there's good karma, bad karma, and different karma. But what does karma really mean? It means action. Actually, it means reaction. It means conditioning, causation, conditioning. It's not that far out. It's not even Eastern. Has anybody ever read the good book, You Reap What You Sow? That's called karma in, in Sanskrit and Pali. Kama in Pali. Karma in Sanskrit. Man's faith in existentialism. What goes around comes around. But the causation is conditioning, habituation. The bad news is we're heavily conditioned. The good news is it's just conditioned. We can recondition and decondition. In fact, that's what the liberating teachings are all about. How to get free. How to get free. How to get out of our rut of dissatisfaction and suffering, confusion, delusion. How to be free. Liberation, not just joining, not just the new congregation, not just congregational religion, but transformative spirituality. Buddhism, after all, is not a faith. It's a wisdom tradition. How we can become as wise and enlightened as Buddha, that's Buddha's radical war cry. 
how anybody can become as enlightened and wise as Buddha. Not just on one only begotten son and not daughter. 2,500 years ago, Buddha made this radical war cry that anybody can become enlightened by following such a path. Anybody, male or female, any color, smart or dumb, literate or illiterate. Let me go further. I'll pose it. Buddhist or otherwise by following such a path. And millions have. Through practicing these virtues, through reconditioning in these directions. We all say we want to change, we want to get out of our rut. But who's ready to change? Who's willing to change and face the unknown? Who's able to change, knows how, and to persevere and stick to it? Who's ready to give up this cozy, smelly nest at the bottom of the rut? You, know, you might have to sacrifice something to change, to get out of your rut. You might have to leave behind the rut and that com- cozy prison cell at the bottom. That's a nice, com- comfortable nest, smelly old sleeping bag or whatever you've collected. Your story, that long vestigial tail of excess baggage that you're dragging along everywhere like a box, a, a train of boxcars paying for every kilo of excess baggage. Who's ready, willing, and able to change? That's the thing. That's why we, we have the fourth paramita, effort, vidya, heroic courage, effort, enthusiastic perseverance, virya, paramita, vira, heroism, courage. The fourth practice of the bodhisattva, which leads to the fifth, dhyana paramita, meditation, contemplation, dhyana, the word of the rujana, by the way, the word, root of the word Zen, Chan, by the way. Dhyana, meditation, contemplation, the fifth paramita, which brings the sixth paramita, wisdom, transcendental wisdom, Gnostic wisdom, not just learning and information and knowledge, but liberating insight, inner illumination, discernment, wisdom, recognizing the nature of reality and knowing ourselves. Lao Tzu said, to know the world is knowledge, to know oneself is wisdom. Prajna Paramita, Punya in Pali, Prajna Paramita, Punya Parami in Pali, Prajna Paramita in Sanskrit, Transcendental Wisdom, more or less in English. A combination of practical and metaphysical or or, or spiritual understanding. Practical and uncommon common sense and mystical to know oneself, to know our place in the world, to know God and our relation to God. However you look at it, the higher truths, wisdom, the sixth paramita, the sixth transcendental virtue that we can practice. We develop wisdom. In Tibetan Buddhism we say we develop it in three or four ways. And I'm not going to say meditating, prayer, vegetarianism. We develop wisdom by learning, hearing, learning, by contemplation or reflection, checking it out, analyzing it, not just swallowing it whole, taking it in, learning. Second, chewing it over, analyzing it, examining it, reflecting on it. And third, getting used to it or meditating on it, integrating it, making it part of ourselves. And fourth, applying it in life. Living it. We become wise. Like Buddha said in his Eightfold Path, the first two uh, steps on the Eightfold Path. Clear vision and pure intentions, or right, or wise vision, seeing things as they are, and clear understanding of how things work, karma and interconnectedness and so on, selflessness. So we can develop wisdom, which is the whole point. Not just believe in it, or once Buddha had it, or some, or it's good, or God is omniscient. No, we have to become as if omniscient. That's the point of Buddhism. To be the change, as Buddha said. Or maybe that was Gandhi. Somebody said it. And you've seen one, you've seen them all. The seventh paramita is skillful means, upaya. Sixth is wisdom. Wisdom sees things as they are, sees what needs to be done. Seventh, we need skillful means. We need to develop competence, resourcefulness, intelligence, skill in means and methods to know how to do things, how to accomplish what needs to be done, how to heal, how to help people, how to be a wish-fulfilling jewel, a bodhisattva. And eighth, tub, tub, is power or empowerment, not just power over others, self-power, energy, leadership, influence, 
Power, empowerment. Ninth is aspiration or resolve. I was glad to hear that I think Shaila herself is going to teach on aspiration, resolve, and something else in a few months if she ever comes out of retreat, which is, I can tell you, knowing her, doubtful. <laughs> when you're in retreat, you know, I mean, of course you have your ups and downs. You know, you have your bad air day where you can't find your breath and your good air days. But, <laughs> but it's like when you're really in retreat, if you're a retreating type, if you're a nun like practitioner like Shyla, advanced practitioner, you say, so what, what else is there to do? What else is there to do? The ninth power means aspiration, resolve, determination. The Bodhisattva has a will, an intention to serve and to save all. And we need that strong intention to cut through the murk of our own delusion and confusion, greed, hatred, and ignorance, and so on, and the karma. And the tenth paramita is jnana paramita, authenticity or presence, jnana. The sixth is wisdom, the tenth is jnana, gnosis. It's a very hard term to translate. These are the ten paramitas that we can practice and learn. In this book, I give um, examples of each of those and stories and practices and outer, inner, and secret. You know, for example, like, um, let, let's pick one just to, to look at it. Again, we talked about the outer, inner, secret levels of Shila Paramita, moral, ethical, self discipline. No, we didn't. Dana, giving. Material, externally, internally giving of yourself and secretly letting go, letting be, being in, ter- in touch with contentment. Contentment, the ultimate form of wealth. Non-attachment is dana. Let's look at um, meditation. We all like to meditate, or we try to like to, or we wish we liked to, or we like to try to, or something. I hope we like to try to every morning, or at least once a day. Eh, if you miss a day, it doesn't matter. Most days. Dailyish practice, very important. Can't live without it. I don't know why I'm saying that. I've been meditating every day since 1971. But I'm a slow learner. It really shouldn't take that long. <laughs> I learned in 1968 when I was a freshman at college. But um, since 1971, when I went to India, I did my first insight meditation course with Goenkaji. I, I took a vow with him to meditate twice a day, and I've been, you know, more or less doing that ever since. Mostly more. He's a great teacher. Still alive. Ooh, S.N. Goenka. He's a good example, actually, of being in this world and not of it. He just gave a talk at the Davos Economic Forum last year about Dhamma. Because he's a businessman in India, where he used to be, before he was a meditation master. Goenka Industries. He doesn't need a beard and a robe to be enlightened. He has his little short sleeve white shirt and his plastic pen pocket holder. He's a 50s guy. And he's been meditating since the 50s, and it shows. And so is his wife. Didi Gawenka. They're an enlightened couple. So meditation, the fifth paramita, dhyana paramita. Externally, who doesn't know what meditation is? You know, you sit like a stone Buddha in the garden or in your seat or wherever, and you, you know, try to stop thinking. I mean, that's poor man's meditation, but, you know, there it is. Of course, that's not real meditation. That's just thoughts suppressing, and we have pills for that today. But (laughs) meditation is kind of a quietistic-looking activity externally. You know, meditation, mindfulness of breathing, loving kindness, whatever we do. There are many schools of Buddhism, not to mention other kinds of meditation, so there's visualization and healing and chanting and moving, med- you know, other kinds of meditation. But innerly, what is meditation? It's a gesture of awareness. It's what we do with our awareness. It's not what our legs, our legs are crossed. doesn't mean we're meditating, right? We might be dozing. Innerly, meditation is the intentional use of awareness applied to the present moment. Mindfulness, a non-reactive present awareness. Mindfulness is the essence of meditation. 
Not, not legs, not eyes. You can meditate with your eyes open. In fact, if you can't, I challenge you. If you meditate all the time with your eyes closed, how do you be, practice mindfulness in life? At your job or while you're commuting, you keep one eye closed? Or what? So I like to meditate in the Mahayana tradition, Zen, and Tibetan Buddhism, we mostly meditate with our eyes open. You know, the better to see all the colorful tankas and stuff on the temple walls. No. So we can integrate it more with the t- colorful life that we live in. Not only be aware when we have our eyes closed in our morning meditation room or closet or attic. You know, eyes closed, ear closed, mouth closed, nose closed, body closed, and my, the best mind closed. Then I can meditate. No. That's the wrong, running in the wrong direction. That's running west looking for dawn. Integrated. Awareness of seeing is meditation. Mindfulness of sight is meditation. Mindfulness of sounds is meditation. Mindfulness of feelings and sensations and thoughts is meditation. Not not thinking. Mindfulness of thoughts is meditation. And mindfulness of non-thoughts is meditation. You with me? Not thinking is just one more state of mind, temporary, unreliable. Awareness of it is meditation. Not relying on temporary states of mind, which are just like momentary weather. But the united state of mind, awareness itself, the substratum, the underlying. So externally, meditation looks like a nice, quiet activity. But internally, it's all about awareness, intentional application of non-reactive, choiceless, or present awareness. But secretly, innerly, outer, inner, and most deeply, it's being itself. It's the immediacy of being. It's what animates us. It's innate awareness or it's a kind of inner luminosity. There's no, what words can we put on this? What illumines us? Not just m- what we're looking at, mindfulness of breathing or an object of attention or a picture. What's illumining it? That's the real meditation. The nature of mind, nature of consciousness. Yes, admittedly, these are subtle things. This is why we, if we're studying Buddhism, we have to look deeper. Not just talk about meditation and think it's a sitting activity or it's quiet. What about chanting meditation? What about meditation and movement? Walking meditation? Yoga meditation? Qigong? What about Zen, the art of archery? Haiku? And the Zen arts? Not motorcycle maintenance. That's just a nice story. Of course, anything can be a Zen art. But specifically the Zen arts. Has anybody read the um, Zen and the Art of Archery by Herigal? It's a classic. Classic. Or the Five Rings by Miyamoto? Classic of self-mastery, not quietism, the fearless bodhisattva way, and creating your life, the ultimate art form, being a master, not a victim of circumstance and conditions. Self-mastery is freedom. Because it's not what happens to us, but what we make of it that makes all the difference. The mind or awareness is more powerful, mightier than the sword. That's the secret. Not getting whatever you want through affirmations. The mind's the most powerful thing in the world, or the spirit, the most powerful thing in the world, if you want to look at it like that. So the Bodhisattva path is one of selfless service and altruism, cultivating Shila, Samadhi, and Prajna on the Eightfold Path, ethical self discipline, meditative mindfulness, and wisdom. The three trainings on the Eightfold Path Shila, Samadhi, and Prajna. It's a practice of the ten paramitas, the six paramitas. And if it's overwhelming, if it seems like too busy, if it's too much, just start with one. Try to be a little more generous. And not just generous to charity in the outer way, but innerly, be more, uh, less attached, more giving of yourself, more there for another, a better listener, lending a shoulder and ear, giving of yourself, giving love and encouragement. Or just pick one and work on it, or one a month. When I lived in my teacher, Kala Rinpoche, late teacher, Kala Rinpoche's monastery in Darjeeling in the mid-70s in India, we used to practice one a month and try to really get delve into first paramita, dana, on the outer, inner, and secret levels for a month. And then second, shila, moral self-discipline, ethics, character development. That's a good one also to talk about, just to understand, because if you come away with anything from this, I'd like it to be 
that you can start to look at the spirit of the law, not just the letter of it, with this analysis of outer, inner, and secret or subtlest level. Let's look at Sheila Paramita. Everybody knows the Ten Commandments, the Sunday school virtues, whatever, Girl Scout oath, Sermon on the Mount, level of morality. In Buddhism, we have it too, the ten non-virtues, right? Not to kill, and the precepts, not to kill, steal, lie, sexual misconduct, and intoxicants to the point of heedlessness, and plus a few others like gossip and slander and divisiveness, adding up to ten, three of body, four of speech, three of mind. We all know this well, we're Buddhist students. Well, we could know it. The point is that that's out of morality. But what is inner morality? Not just not telling a lie, but what about deceiving ourselves? Being straight with ourselves? What about the little white lies we say? Oh, the calories don't count if I'm standing at the refrigerator. Oh, I'm going to stop smoking tomorrow. Well, whatever. What about deceiving ourselves? What about lack of genuineness? What about pretending? Inauthenticity. So the inner Sheila is being straight, is being authentic is being true, is upright, is straightforward, is impeccable even, which is admittedly a tall order, but that's, if we're a Buddhist, that's what we're aiming for, enlightenment, a tall order. And not in size, but in vastness, a scope and profundity. So innerly, it's being straight with ourselves, straightforward and, and, and not just externally honest, but true to ourselves. And then secretly, or the innermost level of it, is our innate pure nature, that we, our uncorruptible Buddha nature, our innate pure nature, not something we do. To be in touch with that is the ultimate Shila Paramita. Unimproved by enlightenment, uncorrupted by delusion or samsara. To really true, know our true Buddha selves. So if we can understand these and practice them a little more on the inner and secret levels, we get very far, very fast to the point. We accumulate a lot of merits. We grow a lot in wisdom and compassion and selflessness, generosity and service. We become an altruistic, unselfish bodhisattva warrior, not warrior over others. The mind, the heart-mind is the greatest battlefield, as Dostoevsky said, more or less. The Buddha is called... Arhant or Drachampa, conqueror, Jina, in the sense of conqueror. Not conquered others, conquered the Kalashas, conquered the conflicting emotions and obscurations, the Kalashas. Greed, hatred and anger, delusion, pride and jealousy, the five poisons, the five Kalashas. That's what conqueror means in terms of Buddhism, to conquer ourselves, and not in a very macho, aggressive way. Let's talk about aggression for a moment. Anger is a big problem today. Mindful anger management is, I think, the best program we have to deal with it. But who even knows what it is? That's not our subject, but you can find out about it. But what is basic aggression? Basic aggression, you know, externally we all know what anger and hate, violence is and aggression. But what about internally? What about how we apply it to ourselves with self-hatred and self-abuse and self-loathing and treating ourselves like crap? But then at the deepest level, basic aggression is not allowing things to be as they are. It's always trying to change things. There's nothing wrong with trying to change things for the better. But do we have any room for leaving, for seeing things as they are and leaving them as they are? That's the essence of equanimity, of non-attachment, of letting go, of openness and acceptance. It's the essence of it all. Of oneness, of gratitude. Thank God for whatever you give if you're a theist. You know, thank God for everything. Gratitude and reverence for the miracle of life that we didn't create ourselves. Basic aggression is never allowing things to be as they are and always pushing and pulling. That's basic aggression. That's way prior to and upstream from anger and violence. And we can redress that in balance with cultivating these paramitas like the third paramita, shanti, patience and forbearance. Externally, waiting patiently, but internally, being very tolerant, being very resilient, cultivating these qualities, open-minded, 
realizing we don't know everything. If we knew everything about the situation, we might have a different opinion. So being less dogmatic and so forth. You know, religion today is getting a very bad name, and rightly so, because of extremists, extreme views and, and fanatic fanaticism leading to all kinds of horrible things. Religion, which originally religio means to unite, religion which is supposed to be a force for uniting people, has become a divisive force in our benighted world today. That's why we need to look into transformative spirituality, not just beliefs. And, and be a joiner and a follower. Let's inculcate leadership, not followership in the next generations and in ourselves. Leadership, enlightened leadership. I often wonder where are the leaders of the future going to come from. If we don't change the system, how are we going to get better leaders? Who in their right mind is going to spend 30 or 40 years in politics the way it is today? This horrible, partisan, selfish, competitive, small-minded politics that we have. I think the Bodhisattva ideal is a great model that we can pass on to our children and, uh, and generations to come and, and make a better world possible. And it's very doable. These are virtues anybody can understand. It doesn't even have to sound like a foreign religion to inculcate this kind of Bodhisattva leadership or enlightened leadership, altruistic compassion and action. Seva, as we say in Sanskrit. Service to God or service to the highest through serving humanity, seva, not selfishness. And that's the essence of the Mahayana, the Bodhisattva path, recognizing, the Bodhisattva recognized that we're all in the same boat. That's the meaning of Mahayana, the big boat. We're all in the same boat. We all rise or fall, sink or swim together. And if we don't pull together, we'll be pulled apart. And we can't do it alone, friends. We have to do it together. We're all in this together. No one can do it all themselves but no one's exempt from participating. Even the hermit, even Shyla in her retreat is relational. She's in retreat for all of us, and we're supporting her in retreat. Her retreat's supporting us, inspiring us, right? Even the hermit in the cave is getting food from somewhere. So I can talk all night. I'd like to open the floor to questions now. Please do ask your questions. Don't save it for the book signing at the end. I didn't mention the Bodhisattva vow, but of course that's a part of Mahayana Buddhism that one may have heard of. And Gawenka took it, even though he's a Theravadan Buddhist. The Buddha, of course, took it. The vow, never to stop striving until all beings are enlightened, not just to think of one's personal happiness and, and peace, enlightenment. Yes. Um, thank you for coming here. I, coming I here. imagine that you've met many um, uh, illustrious uh, religious leaders. And my question is, um, we, we're all sort of engaged on this path thinking that maybe one day we'll be enlightened. How do you know when you meet an enlightened person and how many enlightened people have you actually met? And it, or is that even an important question to ask? <laughs> That's a fine question. I don't know how much it will help you, but um, I'm just here to have a good time, so I'll answer it. I don't care if it helps you. Yeah, that's a good question. That's more, what are you striving for? Yeah, what does enlightenment mean? What are we striving for? I mean, it's easy for me to say I've met plenty of enlightened people, but I don't even think about that, really. I mean, who knows? It's very difficult to judge, especially, you know, from where oneself is at. It's difficult to judge. I mean, to me, my gurus are enlightened, but, you know, I mean, I don't know, let's just pick somebody that we all know of, at least, the Dalai Lama. Is he enlightened or is he not enlightened? I mean, can we even judge? He's enlightened enough for me to do the job. You know, like it works for me, which is the whole point of Buddha's teaching. Kalyanamitra, the spiritual friend who helps you along, benefactor. Where he's at, 
How, why does that really matter to us? What do we, People Magazine? Or like the IR, or IRS of Enlightenment? We're going to audit him and tax him accordingly? Or what? So the most important thing to know, I think, is yourself and what you're doing and sort of look into yourself why and how and how's it working. Are you getting worse or better by doing what you're doing? I mean, is that too demystifying? You know, like, is this good for you or not? Like your children, you know, it doesn't matter what they do as long as it's good for them and not bad for them. It doesn't matter if they're in sports or music or science or, or some other subject, right? Life is not about that. Those, you know, it's all equal in a certain way. I mean, it's all di- different, but the parents' bottom line is whether it's good for the children. So I've met plenty of enlightened people, I'm sure. And, and many illustrious gurus, and some of the illustrious gurus aren't as enlightened as the lesser known ones. Let me just say that for fun. Some of the illustrious ones and may not be as enlightened as the lesser known ones because fame is no indicator. You know, fame is, is you know nothing really. Fame is like almost an accident. Not real. I mean, it's not about that quality. It's about quantity, not quality. What was your other the question? How do you know? How do you know? You don't need to know. You don't need to know. It's like, how do you know when you find the right person to, I don't know, date or marry or, or you know, the right job? How do you know? You have to find out. And it's a work in progress. And who can define it? You can read a million books about love or vocation, but you have to, you know, how do you find your right vocation? It's, it's, a, it's a path. And it's not an end game. It's it's an evolutionary journey. And you get deeper in it. And you keep practicing. You know, the great violinist, I think he plays the violin. It doesn't matter what he plays. Yehudi Menuhin, when he was about 94, they asked him, why are you still practicing four or five hours a day? At the, when, you know, when he was 40 or 50, even maybe when he was a child, he was a prodigy, like Mozart almost. He's 94. Why is he still practicing four or five hours a day? You know, that's a lot of playing. If you're that old, maybe he's not in that great shape. Maybe he sleeps a lot. I don't know. That's a lot of practicing when at any age, certainly when you're that old. He said, I think I'm finally getting somewhere. <laughs> that's the Bodhisattva mentality. Infinite beings, infinite journey, infinite boat, all beings, infinite delight and virtue. Not, you know, the kind of job you hate where you just do enough to get by. The opposite. The love that you love, the, the art, the passion that you have, they just, the more you do, the better. But then what is enlightenment? That's another whole subject, and how can we know? So I always say, if you want to know if a master is enlightened, ask his or her wife or husband. <laughs> but if you say that enlightened ones that probably don't have wives or husbands, I mean, that could, that's a discussion you could have with yourself, then I would say, um, check with their mother. And if you say that their mother's dead, I mean, that's possible. You can say, check with their therapist. (laughs) Or their colleagues. (laughs) Or don't even check. Why check? What do you care about them? You know, caring about others is not about checking them out. It's a different kind of caring. As I always say, we don't need the Dalai Lama to teach us how to meditate. Just somebody that can teach us to meditate. They don't have to be enlightened on the 11th Bhumi of the Bodhisattva path. And then what is enlightenment anyway? Who knows if it's that good? Maybe it's better to be like a saint or a mensch or a, a, I don't know, a, a, a good person, you know, a good parent. I mean, what good is enlightenment? You think about that. Alignment's a big pie in the sky to us Buddhists. But what good is it really? Trungpa Rinpoche said, enlightenment, when you, is, finally, in the end, enlightenment, when you achieve it, is the biggest disappointment of all. <laughs> That's a quote. Of course, he was a crazy, wisdom, wise guy, but he was wise. There's a point there. Not to hold it out there 
Enlightenment is not the pot of gold at the ra- end of the rainbow. There is no pot of gold, children. No Santa, no Buddha, no pot of gold at the end. And a rainbow is a circle when seen from above. And it's all gold. That's the pot. Yes. yes I'd That's like why the to... Bodhisattva is not waiting for anything, not waiting for all beings to be enlightened. That's the enlightenment of the Bodhisattva. Seeing through the illusion of time and space, self and others, and all dualities. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd also like to thank you for speaking with us tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about what you mean when you say to cultivate something. What Bhavana, cultivate, the pardon? practice. Bhavana is the word, the Buddhist word, bhavana. To cultivate, to develop, to bring into being. Okay. Like you cultivate a flower. I'm wondering why you're asking, because you certainly know what it means in English, to cultivate a flower or to cultivate a relationship. Mm-hmm. And in Buddhism, you cultivate mindfulness. You cultivate loving kindness. You don't pray for it, right? You cultivate it. Right. That's the word. Metta bhavana. The cultivation of metta, loving kindness. Okay. Vipassana bhavana. The cultivation of mindful awareness. Okay. By cultivating the flower. By cultivating a relationship. Attention. You work on it. You develop it. You bring it into being bhavana. It's a key Buddhist practice, a word, bhavana. Thank you. Like you cultivate generosity by practicing it and, and developing it and bring it into, further into being. You cultivate virtue. Yes. Yes, I'm a, I'm a teacher um, and really responded to your question about how to train youth, ways of training youth in the ways of loving kindness and compassion. The bhavana that you're just talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's a huge challenge. Mindfulness. Right. Is that a question to me? Yes. Yeah, I was how, hoping you would. In your take experience, I mean, how do you actually? Are you aware of programs? How do you do sure. it? Sure. How do you? Yeah. There's a lot of programs. Yeah. For example. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think a harder question is how to train the uh, jaded, gray-haired baby, baby boomers, who know everything and are so hard to change. No offense. Youth are easy. They they want to learn, but we don't know how to teach them very well. I'm not talking about school. Yeah. That's no, what I'm no, talking no, about. No. Model the Bodhisattva example, modeling something. Yeah. The youth they're just looking for someone to imitate and follow in the good sense. You know, I mean, we want to inculcate leadership, but let's face it: the two-year-old, the five-year-old, the eight-year-old needs to follow their older sibling or their parent or something. Yeah. You know. So, modeling, um, being uh, what more subtle ourselves, not shoving the truth down their throats so that they run up for their lives at the earliest opportunity <laughs> from whatever we think they, we want to give them. Yeah. Being more, you know, everybody says, how can we teach children to meditate? I say, you know, maybe um, learn to meditate yourself <laughs> and meditate. <laughs> and if you do it good, it's good. They're going to like it. I mean, even if it's bad, they're going to imitate you. Right? Mm-hmm. The, the children do whatever you do, more or less, for a while. I mean, you know, the first few years, first few days. <laughs> but yeah. be more spiritual yourself. That's how you transmit spirituality to children. Yeah. And then maybe the child, young children are too young to meditate in the sense that maybe you mean. But they're not too young to do like attention exercises like walking on a straight line on a tennis court. You might call meditation games, training their attention spans so we don't have to give them all Ritalin. Meditation games. And then walking backwards, getting one foot on the line after the other. Mm -hmm. Classical Buddhist walking meditation, but applied to children, make it a game. Mm -hmm. Or whatever. Or chanting, or karate, tai chi, qigong, non-competitive sports. I'm a Breath substitute. counting, I'm visualization, yeah. creative visualization, you know, mind training. Children love that stuff. If you make it into games, yeah. if it's play, if it's fun, if it's meaningful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a high school uh, substitute teacher occasionally, and last week I took in a mindfulness bell. And I uh, was very lucky to have a, a good group of kids, and after lunch it was a two-period uh, session. And we did the work. It was a math class. And then there was time. Basically, I brought in the bell and some clappers and said, if you're talking too loud, I don't want to shout at you. 
you get the bell first, and then if it's then you're not listening, then you get the clappers. And that seemed to work very well to the point where they really liked the bell. What's that? And they all wanted to turn it using it. <laughs> but it's that kind of thing of just sort of starting something and then and then inviting them if they have questions to ask. If you could get to the essence though, you know what to do. Yeah. Like the God meditation. I get like I went to a Montessori school once about fifteen years ago when my friends invited me. So the kids were small. So I'm not really thinking, how can I teach them Buddhism or meditation? Yeah, you know, I tell them a little about the Himalayas or Tibet. They don't even know where that is, but make a nice story about the Yeti or something. And then at the end, you know, if the teacher wants me to say something about meditation or, I don't know, prayer or something, I say, let's do the gong meditation. So, you know, what's that? So listen to the gong. Yeah. That's what, that's what I've been doing. And watch the sound. Follow the sound. Watch the sound and go where it goes. Yeah, yeah that's just what I've been doing. Yeah. And that seems to be... Very helpful. Yeah, thank and that's you. something you can do with children and train their mind to get subtler and concentrate and also watch the sound, you know, break their habits a little bit, open the mind. So one of the kids said to his mother that night, she told me, you know, Mom, there was this monk from Tibet, you know, me, there was this monk from Tibet and he taught us the gong meditation. And she said, oh, well, you know, what, what's that? And she said, he hit, he hit the bell and he asked us to watch the sound and go there. And she said, and he said, the kid, I didn't know you could watch the sound. And when I went there, I didn't really, you know, he said, if you go there, maybe you'll, you'll find Buddha or God. He said, you know, I don't know if I did it right or not, but I watched the sound and I didn't find Buddha or God. I was God. <laughs> From the mouths of children. That's a quote. I didn't find, I, I, maybe I did it wrong, but I didn't find, I was it. So that's the, the short route. We don't have to take him through, all of, like I was saying, on my 35 years of the slow train to learning Tibetan and Buddhism and meditation because I started off too, so late and so mental, so overeducated. Unlearning, exactly. A lot of this is unlearning. Or how about a lot of meditation training and deconditioning is undoing the habit of overdoing. Now, of course, there are some meditation retreats for teens, like at the Insight Meditation Center in Barry, Massachusetts, and perhaps here at Spirit Rock in Marin County, for teens or parent and teens meditation retreats. And there are some um, books about mindful parenting and there's a Tara coloring book. And, you know, there are some things going on for the kids, but we have to, this is all, we're in the infant phase here of Buddhism in the West. We think about the centuries and developing some enlightened culture within our culture. Good. Why wake? Wide awake. Good. Diana Winston, yes, she's a good young teacher. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm glad we're talking about children because um, I'm recently spending a lot more time with my seven-year-old grandson. And it's wonderful. It's just wonderful, unconditional love. But, and it's a gift because he's confiding in me deep things that he doesn't tell his parents. And one of them one night was he couldn't sleep. And he said, I just had these black thoughts in the front of my head that scare me and I try to push them back to the back of my head and let the happy thoughts come forward but I can't do it and um, he said I'm afraid I'm going to die his parents had taken him to a funeral and uh, of an elderly uncle and he's been stewing about this ever since and I really felt out of my depth <laughs> on that question. I mean, I tried to help him as best I could, but um, he's asking for help, and I need some help ask, helping him. How old is he? Seven, about to be eight. Yeah, it's tough, you know. When I grew up, they didn't let us see death like that, and I never saw my grandparents in the hospital or in their mm. funeral. Not that that was good, but that was the way. So it's very difficult to, you know, it's like 
when the kids are young, you tell them the dog went to, I don't know. Farmer. The happy farm. <laughs> right. Well, I thought his And when they say, where's grandma, you don't say she's in a box under the ground. That's a little too harsh, right. even true as it may be. Well, I thought his description of the black thoughts in the front of his head and the light thoughts in the back of his head and trying to move them around was really kind of profound. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to capitalize on that. If you have anything to offer, I'd be yeah, happy I to hear it. Well, uh, you know, it's so easy to just give a glib answer. or like I haven't really thought about that before. But it seems like he already has a good, he's looking at his thoughts and his experience, he has a little bit of perspective which even most adults in our culture rarely have about what's going on with them, you know? Just caught up in it, not seeing the different parts of his self or his thoughts. So that's something you could definitely work with, like trying to keep a balance and move them around and they're not stuck. And maybe, you know, like now the clouds are in front and the sun's behind, the black and the white thoughts. I mean, you could say, just think about whether it makes sense for you because it has to make sense when you pass it on, you know, and how white thoughts and the black thoughts could be moving around and maybe tomorrow the weather will be, mental weather will be a little different and we don't have to get so afraid or stuck in any one of those weather situations just like the outer weather changes. I don't know. It's good, it's good I think, to, without sort of always giving them the same catechism, you know, like... Um, I don't know, I grew up in the era of Billy Graham. Now we have his son, Franklin Graham. They, the word Jesus is every third word in every sentence. So, you know, but Buddhists are no better. There are Buddhists who will say mindfulness or metta or impermanence, you know, like seven times in every sentence. To, it's like ad nauseum or some buzzword like compassion. I mean, now we have compassionate conservatism. You know, it's like, what does it mean even? Uh, who knows th that empathy is the root of compassion, and if you don't feel what others are feeling, you don't really have compassion, whatever you call it. Who knows that? Where is that taught? So I think, you know, but on the other hand, it's good to keep, be in touch with the basic wisdom, either that we've learned or understood ourselves, like impermanence or interconnectedness, that these things are interconnected and related and changing but interrelated. You know, relational the black and the white thoughts, but they're all just thoughts. And we can observe them. We don't have to be under their cloud and, and feel afraid or depressed. Well, for that matter, excuse me, when the white ones are there, be elated. You know, elation and depression is just a pendulum swing. Not, elation is also not the goal. We don't have to all be like cream cheese. You know, equanimity doesn't be like flatlining your brain like cream cheese. But, you know, flowing and having the bigger perspective of there's a steady state here of the oscillation, not just jagged manic depressiveness that we're caught up in. So like with the kids, maybe a little bit of a reminder that these two shall pass. And, uh, come and tell me if, how it looks tomorrow is a good way to keep the conversation going about impermanence without giving them a big catechism about Buddhas. Three characteristics of existence are anicca, anatta, and dukkha. And now we're going to translate them. And by the way, what is a not to anyway? I don't know how to translate that. But anyway, oh, you're not even listening anymore. Well, you're a bad boy. I mean, my bad, not his bad. That's why I say kids are not the problem as far as I can tell. It's us. And it's not just us. It's the system. It's the education system, not just the teachers. I mean, if we paid the teachers, we might have some better teachers also. Instead of, instead of giving them food stamps and, and minimum wage. Oh, and a long summer vacation to paint houses. Anything else before we end? Yes, ma'am. What, uh, so what, what if you feel so attracted to Buddhism for a long time? And there are no monasteries around, and yet... There aren't? I don't know. I'm a mm. real new person at this. Mm. Um, but I have been meditating for a long time, just like I made everything a teacher and looked at everything as if it could teach me something. But uh, Buddhism just blows my mind 
away. And I would like to go in that direction, but um, uh, I've been told that you have to want to go to a monastery or you have to have a teacher. And Shyla uh, teaches everybody, I mean, everything. But I'd like to go even more. Maybe that's um, well, have you asked Shyla? entanglement. Have you asked Shyla? Because she certainly knows about the monasteries or nunneries or practice centers around here or elsewhere that you might go to and other ways to go deeper. Okay. I'm, I'm starting off from a... I can hardly believe I want this, okay? Because I thought really... Uh, well, why, don't worry about a monastery then. Why don't you see if you still want it tomorrow? <laughs> oh, I do. I do. It's been a while. <laughs> it's, it's been a while. But how to get it is... I, I, I'm always... It's around. Is this an there are some monasteries and nunneries here and there are other practice centers. And why don't you just... If you want a monastery, why don't you go to like a retreat, which is a monastic situation for a time, like a week, well, month... Three months. Yeah. I'll look for them. Ask some of your people here. They know where they are. My biggest barrier is how much they cost. Ask some of your people here. They know where they are we'll and where the ones are that maybe don't cost so much. I will do that. Thank you. Isn't Achan, what's his name, with the big ears, quite uh, free? Amaro. Achan Amaro? It, see, this guy over here, you can go with him <laughs> to his monastery. You may have to live under a tree, but it's free, right? <laughs> oh, you see? Right. How materialistic of them. Do they take American Express? <laughs> now, there's some very pure people around here. Um, I don't think that's what's lacking. The opportunities are not with black. You know, people always say, where are the gurus? And where are the, you know, and we teachers say, where are the students? <laughs> I, I teach every day. I mean, more or less. Where are the students? Who has time? But Buddha, Buddha famously uh, did not teach Buddhism. He taught what he called the middle way. That's important to remember. Not too much and not too little, not too fast, not too slow, not too tight, not too loose. I think that the most important teaching of Buddhism is the middle way, of balance and moderation and appropriateness, the middle way, the golden mean. It's a, it's a great principle that anybody can remember and use. It doesn't need any foreign languages. It's not mystical or hard to understand like shunyata, like anatta, like karma. The middle way, it's a great touchstone. Is very helpful. And just step by step, a little at a time, you know, gradual. So uh, maybe we'll end here. And I'm glad to sign books or say hello. I'm just going to sit here. So it's been lovely. Thank you all. God bless. Who to bless.